Hi all, uh, welcome to today's support group conversation. Uh, my name is Lyle Kozloff, Senior Support Engineering Manager uh, based out of Vancouver, British Columbia. Who else do we have today? Uh, you have Lee Matos, uh, currently in Southern New Jersey, based out of New York, and I see a lot of great hats. Thank you all for wearing your favorite hats. Lyle, I was going to pass it to you, but I'll go. I'll go. Uh, support group conversation. I'll talk to y'all. I see somebody putting on a hat. Respect. Um, we are the support engineering group. We'll look for questions in the doc if you have any. Uh, looking forward to that. I also wanted to say I added a slide last minute. A little bit of a shout out to the devs. Uh, positive, good, positive things. So I wanted to make sure we didn't forget that. Um, so support getting support. So if you're like, hey, that's a new slide. It is. And I wanted to make sure that the devs got to hear uh, some of the praise from the support team. So if you have a question, feel free to read it out and we'll answer it. Anup, are you on the call? Okay, if not, uh, the first question is, on slide four, does the y-axis show average ticket volume per customer in the segment or average ticket volume? 2.36 sounds low, too low for the entire ticket volume unless the number is in thousands. Lee, do you know the answer to this question? I do not. I did not build this graph. Ilya did. I do not know if Ilya is on the call, but yes. I can get the answer. Go ahead, Ilya. <laughs> Thanks. So this is uh, average of tickets per customer. That would be the number. Yeah. Hope that answers the question. Yes. And Ilya, do you think we can change the heading on that one to make that clearer? Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Next one in here. Yeah, that's also by me. Um, I just wanted to get a view on, do we feel like SaaS has less support volume per customer than self-managed? Why? I, I see you wanna... added some things. Go ahead, Lau. I actually misread your question. You were asking about volume. I thought you were talking about raw number of tickets. Uh, so the first one I think is probably not. <laughs> Fewer customers doesn't make a difference for the volume uh, per customer. But I would say different types of problems would be the, the first thing. Uh, Self-managed rely a, a lot on their own infra. So there's just a very different set of concerns. Like our SaaS customers aren't usually asking about networking, storage speed, and like configuration problems in the same way that our self-managed customers would often be asking about those things. So <clears throat> because there's sort of like we take care of the details in the background. Their concerns are often sort of admin related. Uh, things like accounts in their group. Uh, there's lots of questions on CI and yeah, just very different sets of problems. And I had a follow up on that. Like if we see a particular problem occurring in SaaS, do we then see that pattern and then inform self-managed customers to avoid that pattern? so that they don't run into it? I, ideally, we fix it before our self-managed customers see it. Uh, so on GitLab.com, we run uh, versions, beef, like pre-release versions. And so often, if we detect a problem on GitLab.com, then we will be fixing it before the release date. And then our self-managed customers won't hit that at all. Yeah, so that will be great for a self-managed customer that actually upgrades. But I'm thinking about like, a customer that isn't upgrading and the, there is a workaround, so they just, just don't step into that situation and they get a workaround already. Do we do those kinds of things? I'm going to say yes, but I can't think of an example off the top of my head. Uh, if anybody else has an, if anybody has an example of something that we've detected on GitLab.com and then message to customers, uh, please, company. I know the situations exist. Yeah, I, I appreciate the question. I'm, I'm also thinking, and I think that our, our core support strategy around bug fix is often, we do backport some fixes, but it's also keep up to date with updates, right? That is one of the things that we help our customers understand yeah. that the more up to date you are, the better your experience will be. Um, so we're, we push on that. Um, so it's kind of, you're, you're asking about 
the customers that aren't following that, how do we help them with problems that we might have seen in a, a version on .com that affect them? Sometimes they get backported, but yeah, I think like Lau was saying, it could happen, but I don't think we're me measuring this or, or seeing it a lot. Okay. Yeah, if it's not an issue, don't worry about it. Cool, thanks. Awesome, and I think you got the next one too. <laughs> yeah, I got the next one. So. Um, I'm starting to figure out how we tackle tech debt on the product as a whole, not just in particular areas. And I wanted to see if you, uh, what is the support signal on that? Do you see uh, areas that you know are particularly harder for users to configure because we built on it iteratively and now it, there might be an easier way or features that break often or regress often or just simply hard to scale? Yeah, I see Greg has added some things. Uh, Greg, I would love to have you vocalize them and I'm gonna add some as well under Jason. Great, uh, so yeah, one thing I would say, I'm not sure that it's exactly tech debt, but um, the it definitely breaks things. It has caused a lot of difficulties and ticket volume is when customers don't regularly update their GitLab and they're updating multiple minor versions or especially across a major version, um, updates can be particularly problematic. There are specific upgrade paths you must follow to make sure that everything goes smoothly. And we, we do recommend a day to a week in between steps to make sure background migrations um, have time to complete. I think that itself is a pain point. Um, a lot of times people want to get from 11.x to 13.x and they don't want to spend a lot of time or uh, going through step by step and manually upgrading um, a path that involves like five different steps. Um, and then the larger the GitLab instance is, um, like at scale, scaled instances, we find that the steps to manually update them are often, com customers find them labor intense. Uh, you're doing a lot of the same thing, typing copy and pasting commands into the, the terminal to update. So a lot of customers end up creating automations, um, Ansible, Salt Stack, uh, Chef, Puppet, things to kind of manage updating and rolling out and configuration of their GitLab instances um, at scale. And right now it is a bit tough to support those because it is like every customer is creating their own solution. We do have a great project uh, in the works, the GitLab Orchestrator, which will uh, solve a lot of these problems, give us a single source of truth on how to go about automating scaled GitLab rollout um, safely and in a, in a GitLab approved and vetted way. And I think that will be great. But right now, one, one pain point is updates. And I think as a result of that, we offer live upgrade assistance. I've linked the uh, scheduling and workflow there. Thank you. Awesome, Jason, I assume you're on the call if you just wanna vocalize yours quickly. Uh, yeah, one thing I've uh, seen a lot of, and honestly, uh, the tickets and dealing with and talking with customers, it's something that they're not happy with either, is when it comes to import, export, and backup restore, namely with larger setups, larger instances, uh, when you hit those customers and those users that are, I have two terabytes of data. Uh, it's, it's a struggle. It's nothing no one's happy to talk about when it comes to the backup restore process, just because it's a lot of data and it it takes it, it takes a while to back up anything. So you know, I noticed that's a it's a huge kind of struggle of tech debt, especially like on .dot com where we're starting to see a lot of requests to, can you import this for me? Can you export this for me? Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for raising that, Jason. I think that that's actually a really good point. There, we're seeing a couple of instances, um, small handful at this point, right, um, of people who want to go from self managed to .dot com. And that import export is can be challenging. Um, and that is something that if that becomes smoother, that will be really helpful to our group. Um, and I'm sure customer success as well. Um, and also general backup and restoring uh, is something. Thanks, Jason. 
I threw one in here that I think came to my mind. Um, Giddily, a lot of our larger customers who've upgraded have Giddily included in their stack now, but also it could be backed by NFS still. And replacing that is a challenge. Um, and, and it's not particularly uh, GitLab code-based challenge. It's just orchestrating that. And, and that is something that is, is, uh, takes time and effort. So I just wanted to highlight that. And is there another one? Let me see. Yes, Fabian, are you on the call? Yeah, I'm here. So I'm the product manager for Geo, and I think self-critically I can say that um, complex Geo installations, especially on scaled architectures, are I think a challenge for customers. And you know, they've I think they create support tickets on a pretty regular basis. So that's definitely something we need to we need to improve. Um, I will say uh, Fabian gets a shout out. He's done a lot of great work to help uh, the support team uh, handle those tickets and address those concerns. So thank you, Fabian, for a lot of the work you did there. Um, and you can read your next point, which I think relates to that as well, uh, what you've seen from tickets. Yeah, uh, thank you uh, very much for, for that. And I can sort of, you know, get that back to the team. I really enjoy working with the support and uh, organization as a whole, and also with the support engineers for, for GEO. I think it's, it's really fun. And so I found that um, support tickets are actually a gold mine for product improvements because they show what our customers are struggling with, right? It's not very nice as a product manager because I read them and it's all the things that people struggle with, but in a way, those are the bits where we need to improve. And so one thing that um, I was wondering is, is there sort of a support organization sort of roll up as in these are the top four or five issues that really cost us a lot of time. They, they come up persistently similar to what Anup has said. So we would really love to see that addressed both because of the customer point, but also because it finds resources and addressing those would um, you know, actually reduce the load and increase happiness. Yeah, and Cynthia, if you're on the call, feel free to vocalize your point. Um, I think that that's, uh, uh, or you're, I see you're asking me to speak a little bit more. Cynthia, tell me, tell me what you'd like. Um, I know, like, this was actually, I think, before my time, um, a long time ago, uh, in the life of GitLab, we used to have um, support priority labels for issues. Um, but as far as I know, we deprecated them in favor of the general severity labels. So I don't know if you can speak to that just a little more because I don't actually sure. know the history around that. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll talk for a quick second. Um, my understanding at the moment, Fabian, is that there are a couple of Periscope dashboards that will show you highly linked Zendesk, highly issues that have a lot of Zendesk links on them, right? And that I think is the right place to get the signal. Um, what we found traditionally, and I hope that still exists, what we found traditionally when we did this support prioritization and the challenge always becomes uh, support and product may not be prioritizing the same things for different reasons. And I've learned in my career that that can be okay. That doesn't mean that product is doing the wrong things. That means that we're solving subtly different problems. And that means that the, you may have a greater priority in the shortest of terms, and that's okay. Um, one of the things I wanna add very quickly, we built uh, the support fix process, which is support engineers working on bug fixes uh, to, to work with that, to help uh, be involved in the engineering process and make the product better to resolve those kind of conflicts. But yeah, my current understanding right now is the way you could get that signal, Fabian, is from that Periscope dashboard that exists. But tell me if that doesn't exist or if I'm wrong or off. No, I think I, I saw the link down there. I think maybe Lyle linked it. I wasn't aware that existed. I think that's actually really helpful um, because it also, I think, provides some other statistics You know about the users affected, the IACB impact, and so on and so forth. So uh, that's definitely useful. And I'll, I'll have a look if there are any geo issues in there. Um, but yeah, thanks for, for the explanation. I think that makes sense. I think speaking from my own experience, sometimes it isn't possible to necessarily prioritize all of the things that you know support would like or other folks would like. But um, I think it would be great to at least have the, the visibility um, 
and you know take it into account. So thanks. Perfect. Um, Ilya, do you want to talk a little bit about the initiative you're working on in that issue? If not, I'm happy to. Thanks, buddy. So yes, we, of course, obviously understand the request and we also would like to have more visibility into that. So we are building a few tools to aggregate all the different issues that our tickets are working on. That being said, we do have a way to currently manually export all the issues and then aggregate them on a uh, yeah, on a numbered list, and we will work on providing you and, well, I guess the rest of the company with uh, uh, all the top issues and stages that we are seeing in our tickets in the, I assume in the next two weeks, we should be able to provide more input on that. Awesome. And thank you, Ilya. Go ahead, Lau. I was going to say anything else on that one. All right. If not, Sid, will you show us your hat? And ask a question. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, the first thing was a minor thing on slide eight. I think the unit is off, um, but uh, someone's already on that. And then I want to congratulate everyone on the percentage of linked tickets. I think 64% is an all time high. So well done. And then uh, it's not in the slide deck. But I think it's a very interesting slide. So consider including it next time. It's uh, we're spending more than 50% of the bronze revenue. So GitLab.com users on the lowest tier on the support costs. And how much lower do you think we can get this? I know there's some work being done on two uh, factor uh, recovery automation and things like that. But is, is that like going to totally bring it down to 30% or is that like, oh, it's super helpful, but it's only going to uh, change, uh, change it by 5%? Interesting question. And I think we probably need to take a look um, a little bit more at the data, but I do wonder if our bronze customers, uh, they just need a different kind of support. Like if, I guess what I'm saying is that if there's some sort of like product feature that we can build to automate these away or to make these tickets not happen at all, then yeah, we should take a look at that and build those things. But I think most of our bronze customers are probably sort of SMB and they might be asking more how to questions than they might be having problems with product itself. Uh, so, sense. so it's more of a business user that expects business support. That would be what I suspect. I don't have any data to like actually qualify that. And it, Cynthia or Tristan, if you're on the call, um, you definitely are in the tickets more. If you have any ideas, please let me know. But um, I, I mean, I would say that it, it. I think more analysis would definitely need to be done in order to uh, really kind of look at what kind of questions. Uh, we're getting and what kind of problems we we need to solve in order to kind of move in that direction. Um, we are working on things like deprecating 2FA, but I would say that the 2FA, human intervention of 2FA is actually more of an issue with uh, free users and the support that we're giving to free users and the time we spend on that, which um, in a lot of ways, like we do it, but we don't necessarily resource for. So it's, there's, there's that aspect, but for bronze users specifically, um, I would say we would really need to look at the, the tickets. I think the uh, gamut of issues really spans a lot of stages and groups. Um, Christy, would you like to vocalize your point? I think this is worth talking about as well. Yeah, sure. Yeah, if, if it's how to content that we're missing, then that's a problem we can solve. So uh, just encouraging you to work with the docs team to get that content built once it, once you confirm that that's actually the problem. And Cynthia, I know you work very closely with our tech writing team. So happy to have your collaboration on that. Yeah, we're definitely working a lot with the docs team already. Um, is there anybody from docs on the call? I'm kind of interested actually in our strategy for how-to content, but I can wait until next group conversation. We can talk about that. 
I think I might be your, your closest to Doc's person on the call right okay. now. So I, I can say at a high level, this is something that we're looking at. We actually have user research that's happening on our doc right now, both from a, the perspective of the usability of our doc site, but also what kind of content do you want to see? How do you want to consume that content? How can you discover it? We know that how-to content is a gap for us right now. So it is something that is on our radar. I can't tell you though, I think we're still figuring out exactly what we need to do, but the support team can help us with that. So by all means, y'all have great information for us. Yeah, absolutely. I know I, it just in casual conversations with friends that are casually like try and get lab out. That's been some consistent piece of feedback where it's like, I really want to do auto DevOps, but I just don't even know where to get started. And it's like, oh, yeah, yep, yep, yep. Uh, since we only have a few minutes left, let's go ahead and move on unless there's any other Thing that you'd like to add on that, Sid? No, uh, for now, I'm going on the assumption that, that we won't make a big dent. And if that changes, uh, and that's totally fine. I totally understand that. If that changes, just let me know because I'm, I'm doing some other stuff that is building on that. Great. Thank you. Uh, Joe, are you on the call? Would you like to let us know what your question is? Yeah, certainly. And thanks for providing a uh, response already. So the ask was about non-federal customers accessing the federal uh, support ticketing queue. Um, the uh, situation here is this is a customer that has a ton of federal contracts and initially uh, made a fuss about not having only US citizens supporting their tickets, but we eventually got over it. But if that does come back, I'm curious if there's any process for uh, considering a non-federal customer to use that instance for support. Well, uh, I'll, uh, I'll weigh in on this one. So currently, no, we're not considering it just because it hasn't really come up yet. Uh, we did recently kind of decide federal users should also be able to use the main Zendesk instance. Uh, the logic behind not, uh, you know, the previous decision was just, we didn't think they would care. Um, so honestly, a lot of it's, we haven't considered it just because it hasn't been an ask as of yet. Uh, but I do think it's something we would need to kind of start getting data and metrics around of how many people are we about to talk to because the US federal instance is staffed differently than the main instance support wise uh, because of you know the restrictions of US citizens only and stuff like that. So I think it's something we'd probably want to like surface kind of dig through. Um, generally speaking, though, if they meet the uh, the federal criteria, namely their account territory is uh, US pub fed and they're a premium license or ultimate license or starter 2000, if I recall the number specifically, then they should already be able to access the federal instance since that does have the sync mechanism in place for it. Yeah, for, for, I, I can talk a little bit from the public sector side. I don't think we have a problem with that at all. With with I think the syncing aspect of it that Jason highlighted is probably the bigger issue because the way that he has it tagged to send to automatically sync over to that is is tied to to the the account territory that we have in in Salesforce. So um, I don't know. We can probably talk about this offline, I guess. Okay. Yeah. It, it's not going to be something that comes up uh, on a frequent basis, I wouldn't think. But just want to know that there's options if they uh, do raise this again. So thanks. Yeah, I think we could like open an issue off band and maybe figure out what to do for the the one off edge case kind of deal. All right, any last minute thoughts, questions, things you want us to know? Love things all the hats, thank you. All right, if that's it, then have a great day, y'all. And we'll see Bye. you in Slack or tomorrow. Bye, all Peace. Brian had a great pun there. Hats off to support, I love it. <laughs> It was good. It was good. We're all taking after you today, Lee. Apparently, I made the request. I made the request, Reb. I can't see that because I have to figure out where my phone is so I can actually log into Slack on this silly thing. But yeah, but but just for you, I've got. I like it cool. like that. I respect it. I love it. Thank you. Peace out. Hope, hope to see you soon, Lee. Cheers. Likewise. <laughs>